Hello and welcome to the Bottom Up Podcast. I'm your co-host, Mike Parsons, and as always, I'm joined by the survey monkey himself, Mr. Chad Owen. Well, here we are in the fourth episode in the Survey Monkey series. We've given you an intro to why quantitative research is important, talked about what you need to do before you even dive into Survey Monkey to prepare and create a research plan, talked a little bit about designing surveys in the last episode. And here we are with the my hand is hovering over the button. I'm about to launch it to get a thousand responses. And oh, wait, there's a missing question or a huge typo or we forgot to upload the image. (laughs) Yeah. Hold the press. Just hang on a second because before, which will be in our next show, we talk about how to get people into your survey, a tried and tested warrior's advice from Chad and myself to all of our listeners please preview and check your survey before you send it out. And then check it again and then have someone else check it. (laughs) Right. So here's the thing. Why this is a bit different to maybe publishing a website. Let's say you've got a typo on your website. You can update it and then you know from now on it's all fixed. The problem when it comes to quant research and doing a survey in SurveyMonkey is you've often invited people to fill it out And once you start changing the questions midstream through recruitment of people to respond to your survey, you are basically invalidating the data because not everybody saw the same set of questions. So you can't draw a really broad analysis of the data because you essentially have to split all the data up. Doubling down on this, Chad, the big boo-boo is when you've paid to recruit people in And then you realize you didn't preview and check your survey. And so it's not only cost you time, it's cost you some dollars. Yeah. And if you're sending it to more than a hundred people and you're changing things or you're getting bad data, that could be a several hundred dollar mistake. The numbers only just go up if you're sending it out to even more people. And more specialized people as well. You could easily find yourself spending a couple of thousand on recruitment. So you want to make sure it's right first time. Yeah. And SurveyMonkey actually gives you some really great tools to preview your surveys on not only just desktop computers, but mobile and tablet. Mike, I think we probably get over half responses coming from mobile devices. So there's a great way for you to check that out and preview it straight from within SurveyMonkey. Yeah, because the catch is you're often building this on a computer, on a laptop, but it's actually often responded to via mobile it's much the same in terms of you know newsletters and so forth that it's a majority mobile these days i think the greatest thing to do simple thing take the survey yourself Mm -hmm. and actually you should be in surveymonkey.com if you can be while we're doing this show so you can actually see the area we're talking about but there's actually a tab there that runs from left to right that says summary design survey and then where we are right now is preview and score Now, when you're in your preview and score, you get to see the survey as it would appear to a respondent, and you can actually do it as a respondent, and you can do it on a PC, tablet, or mobile, and it's really good. And right next to it, it has this survey score that we've talked about in the previous episode where they give you an estimated completion rate, Mm -hmm. and your estimated completion rate is basically telling you out of every 100 people that do this, Here's the percentage of people we think will actually complete it. Because the thing to keep in mind, Chad, is the longer your survey gets, the lower your completion rate is going to be because people simply bail on your survey, don't they? Yeah. I mean, you start getting over five questions and that estimated completion rate can start going down pretty quickly. Yeah. So we have seen time and time again, when a team is working on a survey, And particularly when you've got perhaps a broader team that includes maybe a client or a vendor, before you know it, everyone's got a smart question and you're at 20, 22 questions. I would never, ever send out a survey with 22 questions. If they were 22 amazing questions, I'd send out two different surveys a week apart because people don't want to fill out that many questions. I think that's been one of our biggest learnings, hasn't it, Chad? Yeah. I mean, I'll say it again. Keep it simple, stupid. Find out exactly what you want to learn from the survey ahead of time and then be sure that all of your questions are delivering on that promise of finding out what you want to learn. If you're getting a really bad survey score, a prediction of your completion rate, I think the best advice we'd give you is try and break your survey up into two parts 
and do a second survey at a later time. Let's say you had 16 questions, which would be too many, okay? I would much rather do two surveys of eight questions than risk sending a survey of 16. Eight questions, you'll have a really high completion rate. You'll learn some things from that that maybe change some of the questions in the second eight questions. This would be a far wiser approach than that of just trying to cram as many questions into one go. There's plenty of chances to survey your customers and your users. Don't rush it. And one thing that we always love to do as well is send the survey to our colleagues first before sending it out because every single time we've done it, someone has you know made a suggestion on how to improve it, either adding or removing an answer, rephrasing a question to make it more clear what you're trying to learn and understand. It can only get better by sharing it with others and it just makes the user experience from the survey taker's point of view that much better. One sort of last advanced ninja tip is that often advanced surveys will have a form of logic in them, meaning that if a respondent answers the question in a particular way, for example, if they choose answer A, you're going to send them to a different page or question than if they answer question B. And what happens is in the preview and score, you can actually preview the logic side by side as you go through the survey in a side panel. SurveyMonkey will show you the logic that's underneath what you see. And this is like really, really helpful as you preview and check. And Chad, look, I think I've got some even more folksy advice. I think if you're getting to the point where you're not sure if the survey is good enough to send out, is it maybe too long? Are the questions right? I would honestly give people this advice. Pause, go home, sleep on it, come back to it in the morning. Because with this, it's kind of like, Better not to send it than send it wrong. It's a bit different to a website. A website, people are like, just get it up. We can always change it. You don't have that privilege with surveys, do you? Well, not without spending more money to get more responses. <laughs> exactly. If you're actually surveying your existing customer base, like you should be sparing in what you ask because they only have a limited appetite to share with you what they're thinking and feeling. So what do we do after we've proofed and checked it? How do we get people to actually fill out our surveys? What a golden segue there, Chad. And yes, in the next episode of the Bottom Up Podcast, we're going to look at collectors in SurveyMonkey. These are essentially the doors and windows that open up a world of users giving us feedback to our survey. And there are some dark arts, there's some complexities here, but there's also some great opportunities to get massive insights into how your customers and users are thinking. So that will be on the next episode of our Survey Monkey series. Chad, are you ready to sign off and jump into a world of collectors? You're going to learn actually my favorite feature of Survey Monkey in the next episode. So stay tuned. Ooh. Sounds good. All right, everybody, if you would like to know more about the Bottom Up podcast, you can jump over to bottomup.io. This is Mike and Chad signing off for the Bottom Up podcast. Mm-hmm.